this homework that's due in two days. Oh, happy Valentine's Day, everybody. The homework is to modify your Hello World program so that it does a few extra things. It does a better job of checking its arguments and issues an additional error message. And also so that it exits with correct er exit codes and mainly that, so that it builds as a position independent, dynamically linked executable. What does that look like? It looks like this line at the bottom of the next slide. That's how I plan to build it. <clears throat> if you want to use a uh, make line at the top of your file, that's easy. That's uh, make dollar sign AS. And then the next thing is dollar sign make then. Uh, followed by, of course, dash LC and dash pi. Those need to be added. You can find plenty of examples in previous slides. <clears throat> A little information about where the command line stuff is to be found. You're starting directly from Linux, so you'll need an underscore start. And the dynamic loader will not mess up the stuff that's passed to you. You'll find RxC at the top of the stack followed by RV0, et cetera. There's a, there's a diagram of this uh, in last week's, or last, uh, in our previous lecture. As always, pay attention to callee saved versus caller saved register. This is a summary of the calling convention in a previous slide, and you can find lots of information about it online. Uh, and just pay attention to those registers. If you use a callee saved register, then you're usually responsible for saving the old value and restoring it because you're the callee for whatever called you. That doesn't apply in this case. And uh, you should be sure that you understand why that doesn't apply in this case. But you're still responsible for caller saved registers, right? If you call something like A to I or uh, put S, you're the, you're the caller of that routine. And caller save registers are your responsibility. So you gotta pay attention to those things. Tools, uh, we have a tool section today. Today's tool is Python, the Python language. Uh, if you wanna learn Python quick, there's a great site, Learn X and Y Minutes. And I put a link to the Python one there. It's basically just a, a, a big set of examples that you can, uh, if you're already pretty familiar with a number of programming languages, just churn through them and you're in pretty good shape. They're all actually decent. Otherwise, I would recommend that you go on the web and find you some videos or web pages. There are books, there are online books, uh, but actually the official Python documentation is pretty good. Uh, and you can find that at the link I've got on the slide. <clears throat> We're going to use Python 3. There is no reason anyone should ever be doing anything with Python 2, unless for some bizarre reason you have to. Otherwise, Python 3 is the way in the future and you should be doing it. You should not be fooling with, with Python 2. And in fact, you should be, you should be using Python post Python 3.5, and we will be here, so you're fine. <clears throat> you might consider installing IPython. IPython has a nicer interactive shell, and it has tab completion, uh, one of the truly great inventions of humanity. I think it's like fire, the wheel, uh, indoor plumbing, and then tab completion. I think those are the top four uh, inventions of humanity. Tag completion is going to be great, uh, especially when you're dealing with a new package that you don't know much about. Uh, I think you'll find that to be really good. Another nice thing about Python is that it's very interactive. And so you can try things out in the shell, and then you can, you can then put them in your program and, and see how they work. To install uh, Python, I recommend you do this first line right here. Sudo apt install Python is Python 3 which basically tells your system, when I say Python, I mean Python 3. I would recommend you install Py IPython 3 as well. 
this is this is IPython. It's just recommend it. Uh, you can check that out by just typing Python, and you'll get some information about what's installed, and you can quit. IPython, a little bit different prompt from which you can quit. And IPython is actually just a module that's loaded by Python. And so if you wanted to just run it this way, you can. To emphasize the fact that it's just a little additional module that goes on to whichever Python you already have on your system. In fact, the IPython executable is just a script that starts Python. Speaking of scripts, <clears throat> Your Python code will be written in a .py file. They tend to have the structure you see over here. And I'll go over that in just a minute. Python is both, <clears throat> sorry, I'm not quite fully over COVID yet. I'm not contagious, but uh, I'm still suffering some of the effects. <clears throat> Python is both an interpreted and a compiled language. The Python compiler produces bytecode much the same way that Java does. It takes your .py files and it creates .pyc files. And uh, that's great. It's, I think that it's great that it has both of these properties. It's, it's, it's interactive, so you can play around with it at the prompt. In fact, you can go to this website right here without installing Python or doing anything and just play around with Python through your web browser. That, that's kind of neat. <clears throat> All right, this script over here. So you want to you tell it how to start the Python interpreter or the compiler. It'll figure out which one you need. Things get compiled when they are included by another file. So don't expect every little script you have to automatically get compiled. It's not with Python functions. So here we have the little shebang, the little hash mark followed by an exclamation mark. And then I use user bin env, which says look up an executable in my environment. And that executable is Python 3. And so that will go and find whichever Python 3 is in my environment and run it, passing it the rest of this, of the, the code in the body. We have a little documentation string here that says what the purpose of the file is. Notice the little three tick marks at the beginning and the end. Comments and stuff, imports, whatever you, whatever you want to put in here, define functions, classes, all your code. And then at the bottom, I like to have this. This is a pretty common Python-ism. So we see if the name of the current module is main. And if it is, then we do something. So this is code that runs when this file is run from the prompt. If you import this, this doesn't run. So this allows you to have things that run when you, when you make this file executable and run it at the prompt. And so in this case, it would just say, hello world. <clears throat> I, I love, <laughs> because I'm, I got a strange bent to me. Uh, I love it when people tell me, oh, here's how it finds your code and shows me this, this sort of twisted flowchart. Because, you know, you can often find vulnerabilities when there's complexity. And, uh, and there have been vulnerabilities in the Python uh, lookup strategy before. So I just put this up here just, just for fun. You know, this is just an aside. I don't expect you to know it. But it's also a good place for me to point out that Python is sort of defined by these PEPs. This is PEP 3147, Python Enhancement Proposals. And you'll find them online and there are links to them. And they will tell you something about why things were chosen to be the way they are. And in fact, this tells you, I want to import foo. Can I find foo.py? Yes. Is there a, a cached version of the compiled one? Yes. Then load that. No. Is the cache exist? If not, make it. Then compile, byte compile foo.py, write it into the cache, and we're good. So, so there you go. This gives you a sense of how the whole compilation process works. Python is a dynamically typed language, and that can mean a number of things. But in this case, what that means is basically the type of an object is, uh, or the type of a variable is, depends on the contents of the variable. If the variable points to a string, then its type is string. If it points to a complex structure, then its type is that complex structure. And 
the the there is no type associated with the variable itself, so that can change throughout runtime. And so there's not really, unless you write it, any type checking in the system as such. You can still get type errors. So I put at the top, we said A equal to five, we print it out, prints five. We said A equal to the string five, print it out, prints five. A little bit tricky there. Uh, the type of A in this case is string, str. I could say A colon int equals five. This colon int is a type hint, and it's just a hint. So I put this in, and the Python system says, sure, your A colon int can be the string five. I don't see why it couldn't be. And it's fine. It ignores type hints. At runtime, at compile time, uh, at interpreter time, it ignores type hints and just does whatever you tell it. We'll see how to make these type hints actually mean something a little bit later. I import math. I take the square root of five, there you go. I try to take the square root of eight, which if you remember is the string five. And now I actually finally get a type error. Now, because it's dynamically typed, you have this, this interesting problem that type errors do in fact arise, right? It, it is the case that you will encounter functions that may check their arguments or may do things with their arguments and object if you did it the wrong thing. <clears throat> and it could be that somewhere in your program, you were doing some stuff and you put a value in a structure. And that structure got passed around and copied and became part of another structure and it moved around. It got serialized to a JSON file. You went away for a couple of days. You came back, you deserialized the file, you moved it around, you did some stuff with it and suddenly your program fails. And it fails because way back a couple of days ago, something got put in that wasn't the right type. So one of, the, one of the downsides to dynamic typing is that you can have problems that occur very far from the source. Right? You don't fail fast, which is, which is great. If you fail fast, you can catch the problem and fix it. You, fail, you can fail really slowly uh, in the world of dynamic typing. And, uh, and that can be problematic. <clears throat> so we'll see how to deal with some of that in a moment. Python has a REPL, a read, evaluate, print loop. REPLs are awesome. And that's what's happening here. These little three uh, chevrons here are the, are the interactive prompt for Python. It's a little bit different if you're using IPython, but uh, then you can type the instruction after it and it shows you the results of it. Python is getting static typing as an optional thing. So remember I showed you earlier that colon int? Well, I've, I can also define the return values of things like main, main returns an int. And uh, if I put this information in here, like times is an int, string is a string, I, I would like to be able to verify that those static types are honored throughout the program because then I can avoid that weird type problem I was describing earlier. Static typing is pretty universally recognized as the way to go for large, well-maintained programs and libraries. The C language is statically typed. Rust is statically typed. The list goes on and on. And so uh, that's great. As Python is more and more widely used for more and more complex algorithms, it really makes sense to have some discipline over typing. Type systems are there to help the compiler catch errors for you, right? It's, it's more information the compiler has to say, I think you're doing the wrong thing here and to object. So <clears throat> you can specify type hints, but the interpreter and the compiler don't check them. How do you check them? You can check them using a tool called MyPy. Uh, so MyPy is itself Python code. You can go and take a look at it and you can install it using sudo apt install MyPy. And some of the ways that type hint hinting works in Python is, is not obvious. I mean, this is being added to a language that's already quite mature. And so there's gonna be some, some funny business to it. If you wanna read about type hints, I recommend you go look at the official documentation for the typing package. It's, it's really good stuff. Also, here's a little blog post that talks about type hinting and, and how it works and some of the 
some of the challenges to making it work. In particular, there are cases where you want a recursive type, uh, a, uh, a, a type that refers to itself. Uh, for example, a like a linked list or other kinds of, of data structures may need to refer to an instance of themselves. For that, you actually have to use either a forward reference or a string, and it's kind of nice to know how that works. Lint. So why is my Python not working? What am I doing that's not the right Python thing to do? Well, I recommend you install PyLint. Pseudo apt install PyLint will get you PyLint. It's pretty nice. It gives you uh, a lot of information. It, and the main thing that it gives you is a little code at the start that you can look up online to see exactly why it's telling you you shouldn't do the thing you're doing. And that can be kind of hand, kind of handy. So over here in this code, this is nice, some nice uh, pleasant Python code over here. It shows some examples of typing. We import sys. Why do we do that? I need sys in order to, ac in order to access the command line arguments. So if you want to ac uh, access RV, you need to import sys. Here's my main, it returns an int. And I check to be sure that my arguments are three. If not, I write an error and return one. Then I take my first one, I convert it to an int. That's the number of times. The second one is a string. And then I write out the string that number of times and return zero. It's not like pretty familiar to you, right? This looks like the last assignment that you had. This is a main function. It doesn't run, in, run by itself. So down here at the bottom, I check to see if name is main. And if so, I run the function main. There you go. That's a nice little example, I think, of a little Python program. And if you run PyLint on it, it will complain. Because right here, the index variable for this loop is not used. It's, it's declared, it's given a name, but it isn't used. And the lender doesn't like that. It thinks that could possibly be an error. And it could be. So what do we do to tell it we don't want to use that? We can replace it with underscore index, in which case it's fine, or just underscore by to ignore the, uh, the loop argument altogether or the loop index altogether. So there you go. That's how you would type check it. And this should type check just fine. And that's how you run the linter over it. And once you make that little change, it should lint just fine. <coughs> functions. So we've seen a few functions already. Functions are defined by saying def. I have to define a function. And notice the colon here at the end. So uh, if ends with a colon, else ends with a colon, the definition ends with a colon, so on. All of these, all of these lines that introduce something end with a colon. Indentation is important. There's no brackets in here around this. Python figures out what is nested, what is a nested statement by looking at the indentation at the start of the line. Now that means I can't easily just have a line, split a line wherever I want. I can't do that. I can use a backslash as a line continuation character, or if I'm inside a parenthesis or something like that, that's fine. I can split the line there. But Python expects the indentation to be consistent. So if this were a tab and this were spaces, Python would complain, it would fail, and you'd look at it and wonder why. It needs to be exactly the same indentation here for this to work. Doesn't that be four spaces like I have here? It can be two, can be eight. It doesn't matter as long as it's consistent. All right. A couple more things to notice in this tiny little program over here, where I say hello to a bunch of people. This little guy right here is an F string. Notice the little F in front of it, that makes it an F string. And this does interpolation. So inside curly braces inside the string, I can have expressions like name, which is the argument passed in, or I could have more complex ones like function invocations or math or whatever I wanted in here. And I can even use formatting codes. So I could write numbers in hexadecimal and, and all of that. F strings are pretty flexible. I wanna say hello to everybody on the command line, but I don't wanna say hello to my own program. So I omit it using an array slice. So I take sysargv, which is the array of arguments, and I say everything from index one up to, and I omit the end, which just says, give me everything else. It's an array slice. 
pretty pretty uh, handy, fairly simple stuff. If you want to read about uh, F strings, I would point you to the official Python documentation. There's a nice tutorial on F strings that you can have a look at. Strings are written inside double quotation marks or single quotation marks. There's no notion of a simple character, not an easy one. Uh, there are byte strings and other things that we'll maybe touch on in a few minutes. But for the most part, strings can be double quoted or single quoted. You may notice that this string, which is documentation for this function, is in triple quotes. And that's because the first thing you put inside a file or inside a function or inside a class can be the, one of these strings. And if it is, that becomes a documentation string. And you should always do this. So after you start a definition, write a string that describes what this thing does. When you start a file, write a string that describes what the file is. Super helpful. And by convention, you should use the triple quoted version, the multi-line version. Right? Triple quoted ones support multi-line strings. So I could have three quotes, and then I could have a whole bunch of stuff ending with three quotes. So you can document all these things with multi-line strings. If you do that, <clears throat> then you get documentation online basically for free. It's really handy. There's a lot of things in Python to help you navigate packages. And that'll be really important when you're looking at some new packages you're not familiar with. You can get help using help. Uh, and so up here, I import function. What is function? Uh, I think function is one of the previous things that I've, I've shown you. And I can say hello to Fred. Hello, Fred. If I do dir, this tells me all of the things that are defined in the module hello. And so you see there are several things in here, including this underscore underscore doc, which is the documentation string that we added at the start of it. This is the file name and, and so on. It also defines something called hello. And I imported sys, so that shows up too. If I print the hello doc, it Prints the little string that I defined earlier. And if I ask for help on the function that I imported, it tells me help on function module. Here is the doc string at the start of the file. Here's the function I defined, and here's the doc string inside that function. So you can get a lot of information uh, about what's going on in a program or, or in a module using this facility. And you should use it yourself. You should get in the habit of always having doc strings in your code. Basic operations, simple stuff. Uh, division by default is, in this case, takes two ints and just gives them back a float. It's independent of the, uh, of the type. This is integer division. So five divided by two, we'll, we just drop the remainder, that's two. If I wanted to do this, so I could also do it this way, five divided by two, and then convert it to an int. There you go, I get two. Five integer divided by two. Well, it's too late. I've already thrown my remainder away. And so I get 2.0 here. I can convert this to a string. All right. So you can see that it's pretty easy to convert among types. An integer five and a float two. Notice these are strings. They get converted to the correct things here. I have an integer five divided by a float. That's perfectly fine. Python will do that. Because again, division doesn't care what its arguments are. It just does the right thing. 2.5. Hex 10 is this. Binary 10 is this. So 0x and 0b. I can take a hex. So here I take 0xff, 255. I had one to it. That gives me 256. I convert that to hex. And then I convert the result to an integer using base 16. And I get back 256. I can also specify base zero. And if I have the leading zero X, or is it zero X or zero B or zero O, it'll do the right thing. Zero O is for octal. <clears throat> it'll just do the right thing. And, and hex puts that stuff in front of it. So I can also say base equals zero and it will just do the conversion. If I have you write a program and I tell you specify an address as decimal or hex, in your brain, you should say, aha, all I've got to do is take the string from argv 
and call int on it with base zero and it'll do the right thing. Pretty easy. Basic operations are mostly what you expect them to be. The caret is exclusive or. The percent is remainder. Exponentiation is two stars. So there we go, five squared is 25. 5.0 squared is 25.0. Is in this case, it inherits the type from the arguments. And here's the square root of 25 is five. And I can call eval on a string, like six times five, and get back the result. Plus, minus, times, divide, all those things work the way you expect them to work. And they have the priorities you would expect them to have. <clears throat> if. So here's a little, uh, little piece of code that demonstrates the use of if. So here I have a little function that I've defined, test value. It takes a value, which can be an int, and it doesn't return anything. Here's my documentation string. If it's greater than 21, pass. Now, what is this pass? Well, when after Python sees this colon, it expects to see an indented line here with something on it. And if it doesn't, it will complain. So in order to have nothing here, to have an empty body, we say pass. That's just how you have an empty block in Python. Else if, or elif, I check to see if the value is greater than or equal to 10. And I print at least 10. Else if the value is greater than or equal to 5, at least 5. Otherwise, the value is too low. So then down here in my, uh, in my interactive piece, right? if I imported this, I would get test value as the function. But if I run this at the prompt, it will actually run this code down here. For a number in this array, specify arrays and square brackets just like this. And iterators are pretty simple. So, so number takes on the value 1, then 5, then 19, and so on. I would print, I'm using an f string for this, value equal and the number. And then I would do test underscore value of that number. So let's see. Uh, there we go. And so sure enough, testify runs and value one, too low, five, at least five, 19 is at least 10, nine is at least five, 22 is nothing because we pass, and 14 is at least 10. All right, ifs are pretty simple. Loops are pretty simple, so I did these interactively. <clears throat> so if you're, inter if you're in interacting with Python, here I define a little variable, a is 13, and then I start writing a loop while a is greater than 10, colon, and when I hit enter here, the Python interpreter will know that I need to add a body to this, and it will prompt me with three dots. And I can say, I can indent, and say print A, and then subtract one from A. And when I hit enter on a blank line, it says, oh, you must be done. And then that loop runs, 13, 12, 11. Here I use a for loop, and I want the for loop to count from one up to 10, and I want it to count by two. And this is how you do that. You use a little thing called range, one, 10, two, and you see I get one, three, five, seven, and nine when I do that. And you might notice, and also get done, you might notice that I have an else for this for. That's fine. The for loop or the while loop will run. The else is going to run at the end of the loop. Or if this loop never ran up here at the top, let's say A started out as nine, which is not greater than 10, the else would run. Python has exceptions. It has an exception handling facility. Uh, to get an exception, you say raise, and you give it some kind of an object, and it raises that as an exception. To catch exceptions, you can use a try block. So here's try colon. I run the code that might generate the exception. And then I start catching exceptions. If you program in Java, this is going to look a little bit like Java. So I might look for a permission error. And I grab the permission error as the variable error so that I can then print it out. I use an F string and I say bad permissions error. File not found error. I don't even capture the error here. I just say 
no such file and give the file name. If it's something else, I just say bad thing happened, whatever that might be. Otherwise, right, if none of these exceptional cases happen, then I close the stream, right? This must have worked. I can close the stream. And then finally, always runs, right? So these exception, these accept clauses run if a particular exception happens. This else clause runs if no exception happens and finally runs whether or not an exception happens. And then I'm done. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. This is a really quick introduction to Python. Python is an object-oriented programming language, so it has objects and classes. And much like most other languages, a class is essentially a template for creating instances of that class, which are themselves called objects. Modern Python has an object hierarchy similar in many ways to Java's. Everything inherits from object. If you want to specify what you inherit from, you put it in parentheses after the name. Implicitly, Greeter is inheriting from object, but you don't have to say that. So here's my Greeter class. Notice it's got a doc string. <clears throat> Where is my new? Where's my, where's the thing that initializes an instance? It's right here. Underscore, underscore, init. Underscore, underscore. It's what initializes an instance. So Python will build an instance of Greeter and hand it to you as self. And then you can modify it as you see fit. In this case, I add a variable to it. Self.greeting is equal to the greeting that we, we pass in. This gets stored in the instance, not in the class, but in the instance. Later on, if I want to get a greeting, I give it a name. Self is the first argument. And hands me back a string. Here's my doc string. And I return self greeting plus space plus name. And I can just directly greet somebody, which will write it out. It is a println of self get greeting name. So it just goes ahead and calls this to get the greeting and then prints it. Here's my main function where I make a new greeter. Right, there's my, there's my variable with its type. And then this is how you invoke the constructor. You give it the class name and then the arguments in parentheses. And then in this case, it's going to run over all of the arguments except for the name itself, greet each one, and we're done. And this is a traditional way to write this little block. You don't want to have a lot of code in this. You want to just say, if I'm interacting, call me. All right. You, this shows some in, an instance variable greetings, but you can have class methods and class variables. Uh, those are unique. They take class as the first argument, usually written CLS because class itself is a keyword, so CLS. And you can modify the class in the same way. You can add variables to it or even add functions to it or modify it. And you can also have static methods. Static methods are basically methods that don't depend on the class or on an instance, they're just a method or a function that's hidden under the namespace of the class. Spacing bizarre, but, but nothing too elaborate. You can use underscore, underscore, new, underscore, new, underscore to control how the initial self object is created. You can actually use that to make something different under certain circumstances. Uh, don't need to get into that. Wouldn't worry about, wouldn't worry too much about that. Uh, this should be enough to get you really far along. Yep, add variables to an instance of the class and, and it initializes it. That was your introduction to Python. Again, tons of resources out there on Python. Very popular programming language. Very nice uh, and easy to use, I think. Uh, it's, it's, you know, a lot of people love it. I think you will find it slightly easier to learn than assembly. Right, so on a scale of one to 10, if assembly is, it's moderately hard to so give it a six, uh, Python is a one. So you should be, you'd be much happier. Let's talk about Capstone and PyElf tools in reverse order. Let's talk about PyElf tools first. So you can go to the uh, GitHub site for it if you wanna take a look at it. PyElf tools is a Python library for reading elf files. 
does just what it says on the tin. You point it to an ELF file, it's going to uh, read in the header, make the contents of the header available. It's going to read in uh, the sections and segment tables, the string tables, the symbol tables, all that information, and then make it available to your Python code program programmatically. The easiest way to install it is with pip, the little Python installer. And you may not already have pip on your system. You may or may not. If you don't, sudo apt install python3 pip will get pip for you. And then you can just say pip install pi elf tools. And you're good to go. And to test it out, <clears throat> you can hop into a uh, Python interpreter. And you can see how that goes. So let's go ahead and use ipython for this. And have I installed ipython on here? I may not have. Oh, I have. Good. Good. Uh, so we can go ahead and I wonder if I've even installed this. I might not have. I have. Yay. All right. So uh, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Elf tools, elf, elf file. So what's going on here? Well, let's import elf tools and do a dir of it. And we see that there's some stuff in here, right? There's the, the, all these little double underscore things are things put in by the system, but there's also common construct dwarf. You may see dwarf showing up a lot. Dwarf is the debugging information in an elf file. Very cute. Uh, EHABI, I won't go into, application binary interface. Elf is what we really care about. Uh, so let's go ahead and while we're here, let's also do help of tools. And look at this. It provides us with a little bit of help. Tells you who wrote it. It's in the public domain. There are some packages in here. That's good to know. That means we can import these. And that's it. So let's go ahead and import elf tools and if we hit tab, we get some tab completion, which again is pretty magical. This is true in IPython, not in Python itself. So we can come in here and grab any of the packages it provides. In this case, we'll grab elf. And now we can do things like dir. What's in there? And we see that it's got a number of packages in it. And we can do a uh, help. And it will tell us, OK, this guy contains these packages. We're going to care about this one. We might care about some of the other ones later, but for right now, we definitely care about elf file. So finally, we can go back to uh, elf file, import it. Uh, see what's in it. Lots of stuff in it. You'll notice that we have. Uh, a number of things defined and some more packages. Help provides us a little more useful information on this one. So we have an object, elf file. It's a class. This is going to tell us a little bit about it. And so you can see we build it around the stream. So I'm going to have to open a file and then I can build something around it. It has some accessible attributes like the stream that you gave it, the class, whether it's 32 bit or 64, machine size, whether or not it's a little Indian, and so on. So there's lots of information in here. There's the header. And there's some methods. So I'll tell you a lot about it. <clears throat> Let's get out of that. Specifying the whole thing this way each time is kind of annoying. You can, another way, instead of saying import something, you can say from elf tools elf import elf file. Now, I don't have to do all that. I can just do that. More importantly, I can go back and do what I did earlier, which is import the elf file object or elf file class. And I can get help on it like this, and, and life's pretty good. Not everybody has done a great job of providing lots and lots of help. Capstone has not done a great job of providing lots and lots of help, but, but that's OK. 
So then we need to open a file. That's easy. Let's open up uh, ls like we have over there, user bin ls. And let's read it as a binary. So basically the same options you would have for read and see. There we go. Uh, and you can see it's got a little IO buffered reader type to it. And now we need to turn that, you know, we need to decode that as an ELF file. So we pass the stream to the ELF file constructor, and there we go. And one of the nice things about Python is if I do a help on ls elf on the variable I just created, it will look at that, figure out what type it is, and give me help for that type. And so it'll say, oh, that's an elf file. Here is the help provided for elf file. Right? Because they wrote a nice, long, comprehensive uh, documentation string for it, which is great. And you should be doing the same kind of thing. So among the things that are in, The ELF structure is, we can hit tab a couple times, and you see we get nice tab completion here. Again, because I'm using IPython, we see there's a get section by name. That sounds nice. Let's go get a section by name. Let's go get the text section. Got it. We could go get the data section. If there's a data section, Let's see if there is. Got it. We could get the uh, foo section. Let's try that. No problem. It's going to always respond, and it's only going to be after the fact that you can find out that section actually existed. Again, this is an instance of something. I don't know what it is, but I can find out more about this variable by typing help with it. And it tells me, oh, it's a, it's a section. And here are some of the methods to get information from it. So text by itself tells me it's that. Data tells me it's that. Foo is not nothing, it's not anything, because there's no foo section. I have to watch for that, right? It has the special type, none type. And so, You can check for it like that. All right. <clears throat> and then you'll know that you didn't get a foo section. So we could get the start address of the entire program, the entry point. By going here, finding out that it's got a bunch of stuff in it. In particular, header. That sounds good. And then these all have the name that they do in the specification. So uh, entry is the entry point. And there it is. And if you wanted to see it in hex, there it is in hex. We could get the start of the uh, text section. Same kind of thing. And there it is. So the text section starts here. The entry point is later on. It's here. And that gives you some information. If you want the bytes that make up the text section, well, use the data, data method to get them. Because it's possible for them to be compressed. And this will handle the, the uncompression of them if needed. What is in data? It's a bunch of bytes. If you look at the first 10 bytes, there you go. And you can see this little B in front of it means it's a byte string. It's not, it's not a character string, right? Because that would be UTF-8. This is just a byte string, just a stream of bytes. And you see the bytes are E8, A, B, F9, FF, and so on. There you go. <clears throat> so an interesting question is, what is the address of that byte? Well, it's that. What's the address of 
that byte? Well, it's that plus one. Okay, shouldn't be too complicated, right? An array is just an array. The zeroth element in the array is the first byte of the data in the text section. What's the virtual memory address of, uh, of that byte? It's the address at the start of the text section. So you'll have to keep track of those and, and add the offset into the array to the uh, address of the section to get actual memory addresses. But you can do that. You can manage that. Enough of that. Capstone is a disassembler engine, and it deals with multiple architectures and platforms. You can disassemble ARM, 64-bit ARM, uh, a bunch of different processors. You can have a look at it to see which, which ones you want. In particular, it will disassemble 64-bit x86 machine code. And we need to install the Python package for it. And again, we can use pip for that. So we just say pip3, install capstone, and then we should have capstone. And capstone is actually a nice little C library, but it's got Python wrappers associated with it. So uh, it'll be nice and, and fast. If you want to later on use the C library to build other kinds of programs, you certainly can. We can test it out the same way. So back over here, CS is a little thing that builds, uh, it's, it's CS short for capstone, that build, will build the uh, disassembler for us. And this is the type for an instruction. We're going to want, we're going to want arch and so on. So, but before we do all that, Let's be sure they have capstone. See what's in it. Lots of stuff is in it. See what help it gives us. And it gives us a list of the package contents and some information about some of the things that are defined in it. Again, interactively using Python is going to be your friend for building these kinds of programs. So back to this. I'm going to. Capstone import CS. That should be a comma CS. Ensign. And again, tab completion is your friend. We can go to uh, Arch. We don't want a, a ARM64. We want x86. That's our architecture. We're also going to want Capstone mode. And we're going to want that mode to be 64. There we go. Hooray. So now I can build a little disassembly factory. I give it the architecture, and I give it the mode. And I could get that information from the ELF file. If I wanted to be more general, I would do that. I would go look at the ELF file and say, are you 32-bit or 64-bit? And then I would choose the correct mode based on that. Same thing for architecture. So I'll do that. And then I have my data sitting around in data. I have the start address of the, uh, of the text section in tstart. And there we go. And so now this builds a generator. It's going to disassemble code but it's going to do it on demand. I could also give it a number of instructions before it's exhausted. Here I didn't, so it's just going to run until it, it fails. To get the next one out of a generator, I can use next, if I spell it correctly. There we go. And I get the next instruction out. And it's a CS INS in instance. And again, I can do help. And it will tell me, in this case, it will fail. But that's OK. I can do that as well. There we go. Uh, let's see. I can get the mnemonic. That's helpful. I can get 
the uh, the operands as a string, or I can get the operands in a number of other ways. Let's let's see if I get tag please to work for me. And it's not. I'm I'm messing something up. That's okay. I can always do dir and see what's in here. Op count. I can find them. Uh, Look at the right, I can convert a register number to a name. There's a bunch of stuff in there you'll, you'll have to look at and, and see how to do. Uh, in particular, the bytes that make up this particular instruction are here. That's good. I can find out how long an instruction is, or I can use size. So if I knew the address of this byte, of the start of it, and I got the next instruction. How would I get the address of the next one? Well, I would take the address I had for this, I'd add five to it, and that would give me the address for the next one. So if this was T start, I would add five, and that would be the address here. I hope that makes sense. All right. Let's go back up to here. There's a chance I typed that correctly. Let's see if I did. And there we go. There's a disassembly of the text section. So you can see this is a generator, so I can use it as if it were just a normal iterator. I just iterate over the things that are in there for each one. I print out the mnemonic and the op string, and look at that. I get a disassembly. I didn't print the addresses, but I could have, right? I know that I start out at T start. I know what uh, I know uh, how long each one is. So each time I would just add that to it, and I could print out the addresses that way. There you go. So that's your quick introduction to this. We'll be using this uh, coming up for the homework. You should play with it and get used to it. All right, that's a lot to cover in a short amount of time. I think we can get through stack alignment and then we'll take a quick break. It's a lot of material today, so let's dig into it. I've mentioned stack alignment before, and now it's time to finally talk about what all that is about. So first, what can you push on the stack? I've talked about this once before. You can push eight byte values on the stack. Those are complete 64-bit registers, or they can be immediate values. Uh, and in fact, eight byte values are the only things you should ever push on the stack. Don't push other stuff, even if you can. You can push two byte values, that's 16-bit values. Don't do that. That's just gonna mess your stack up. It's not gonna be a good day for anyone. Eight byte things are the things that you would want to push on the stack. And over here is a little piece of, of code. You'll notice that up here, I just do a, uh, I just assemble it and I don't link it because you know you can do that. It creates a .o file. Could I link this? Maybe, but it's not meant to be run. This is just there to show me how all these instructions assemble. So at the top, I'm pushing 64-bit values. That works. Down here, I'm pushing some literals. 0, minus 17, 254, and this big number. How big is this? There's one byte, two bytes, three bytes. It's a four byte long number. And that will work. This will work because literals like this pushed onto the stack are sign extended. They are sign extended. And they can be up to four bytes in length, but no longer. I can't write a full. 64-bit literal value and push it. If I want a 64-bit value pushed on the stack, I got to put it in a register and then push the register. I can't push this, even though this is a one, two, three, four byte value because I can't properly sign extend it. The sign bit is set. I didn't say it was negative. So this looks bad. I can't make this be a positive value, positive value in four bytes when pushed. And so the assembler will simply reject it. 
as I've commented it out. These don't work. I can't push EAX because that's only four bytes. I can't push AL, that's only one byte. The assembly will not take either one of those. You can uncomment them and see what it does in these cases. This works. Don't do this, right? But because what I'm saying is push a D word 17. The assembler will ignore this and put and sign extend 17 and push it. And it'll be just as if an, it'll be an eight byte thing on the stack. It will not be a D word. The assembler is once again, ignoring what you're telling it and just doing the right thing. So don't do this because this will just be confusing to you later. This works. I can push AX, which is a 16 bit thing. And I can push this. This is a 16 bit thing. Don't do these. Just don't do that. Don't do that. That's bad. And I can't push XMM, YMM, or ZMM registers on the stack. What I can do is reserve space on the stack by subtracting from the stack pointer and then moving those values into place on the stack. And uh, a lot of things do that. They store uh, these XMM registers as, as temporary variables on the stack. And they do that not by pushing them, but by manipulating the stack pointer and then treating the stack as just another piece of memory. If we run this through the assembly, here's what we get. And this sometimes confuses people because it looks like, uh, like right here, it looks like I'm pushing a, a byte zero. It's not what I'm doing, right? Uh, and this looks like I'm pushing the byte EF. I'm not, I'm actually pushing this value. Remember it could sign extend it. So there are versions of push that take byte and double word and so on. And, and what those are actually doing is they are sign extending a byte or a double word or whatever and pushing uh, the eight byte result onto the stack. So these are the little things. Now, it may be a little hard to squint at this and then page over here and look at this. So what you can do is create a listing file. See this dash L up here and the base file name plus dot LST. That'll make a list file for me. And listing files are pretty awesome. So uh, you produce them by giving NASM a dash L file name. Other assemblers may use different switches. And here's what a listing file looks like. Listing files are kind of neat because they show you the content of the original file, and then they show you what's generated for it. And so if you have macro invocations and you like to know why your macro invocation is wrong, this is the way to do it. Build a list file and have a look. Over here is the line number, then an offset, then the bytes that are going to be out, be emitted at that offset. And then here's the, the, uh, the original code. So if we take a look at push RAX, it turns into a single byte instruction. RBX, single byte instruction. Pushing zero, really nice and simple. This gets uh, sign extended because I can't, but this will fit in a byte, but it won't be properly sign extended if I put it in a byte. And so I expand it over here to be a four byte thing. Same for this, this will work just fine. So I output the four byte. That won't work, that won't work. But this will, pushing double word 17, but again, it uses 6A, the same thing it used up here. So it's really pushing this uh, hex 11, 17, which will then get ex sign extended to be a uh, eight byte value and so on. So this is not pushing one byte. This is pushing eight bytes onto the stack, eight bytes on the stack. The lowest byte is 11 and the others are zeros, okay. All right, so that gets you what you can put on the stack. Let's talk about alignment. An address is n byte aligned when the address is evenly divisible by n. Powers of two are used. So really what this is saying is it's telling you something about the number of zero bits at the end of an address, All right? So these addresses are eight byte aligned. It's easy to see it in hex, be much harder to see it in decimal, but it's Easy to see in hex, they're divisible by eight because at the end we have zero 16s, 
uh, sorry, zero ones, or we have eight ones. And that's what you want, right? So these all have the low three bits zero. 16 by the line, really important. The low four bits are zero. Four bits makes up a nibble. So we expect to see a zero at the end of the address in every case, and we do. All right. In assembly, how do I get alignment? <clears throat> if I want something to be aligned in my, in my assembly, I just say align and the number of, of the byte alignment in front of that thing. And this could actually be something like 10. Sometimes there are reasons to align with things that aren't powers of two, but they're very rare and you probably won't encounter them in this class. Here we align eight. We align this uh, address dot top. And <clears throat> then I, I do some stuff. We'll come into what I do in a little bit here. Down here, I got a section on data. I align it on an eight byte boundary. That's great because these are all quad word addresses. And these are the addresses of these strings. So what is this little piece of code doing? You can, again, you can plug this in and, and run it. I believe I have it lying around. Uh, there we go. And that's what it does. It basically comes in. I put 10 in ECX. I then do an LEA rel lines. So I go and I get lines with respect to RIP. That's this address here, the address of the first of these. And then I take the RDI I just got, I add RCX times eight, starts out at 10. I then subtract eight. Makes sense, right? This would be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I would go too far with the 10, so I subtract eight to get it back. I push RCX, I call put S respect to the PLT. I pop RCX so the push S can't screw it up. And then I do a loop to top, which will decrement RCX and this time through I will, so I will do uh, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. I will count from 10 down to one and I will output these strings uh, in each case. And because these are all eight byte pointers, the quad words, and I would like them to be aligned on an eight byte boundary because that makes the code faster. And then when I run it, I get what I, what I expect to get over here. Notice that the, uh, the, sec the code is aligned here. Here the section is aligned. The, I tell this is a data section. I want the data section to be aligned on an eight byte boundary. I wouldn't have to do this. I could put this in the code itself and just put an align eight in front of it and that would align it. Or I could just say section data and then align eight, and, but that would be a mess. Easier to say, I want the whole section to be aligned. How does the assembler align this on an eight byte boundary if it wouldn't naturally occur there? And the answer is it puts no ops between this move instruction and this load effective address instruction. In this case, I think it puts three to make it work. I think this is five bytes, uh, yeah, four or five. And then it will put three more no ops, which are probably like hex 90s. Uh, in here to align it. And then this will occur on an eight byte uh, aligned address. Actually, let's go. I'm telling you all this, but I could just check. Uh, align. Oh. Let's see what it does. Uh, it does this what I said. So it's a five byte one. I knew that because I know this could be four bytes long. Uh, and then 90, 90, 90 for not. And there you go. And so now it's at eight. So it's aligned on an eight byte boundary. And if you look at uh, uh, O, there we go. Sorry, not quite wide enough. You will see alignment information over here at the end. And you'll see that we wanted our data section to be aligned on an eight byte boundary. And sure enough, it has a line eight right here. All right. Why do we align stuff? Memory is moved around in pages, which are 4,096 bytes in length. They don't have to be. There is, a, there is an alternate giant page size that's available to you in x86, but it's 4,000, it's 4K. We're moving 4K pages away. 
a correctly aligned data element will never cross a page boundary, right? If it's a 16 byte thing, we align 16. There you go. And so we'll never cross a page boundary, which is great. You don't want to do that. Further, the microprocessor doesn't use all the address bits for memory operations. You might think it would, but it doesn't. It fetches things in aligned chunks, even internal to it. When it's moving stuff out of its own cache and moving around, it doesn't use all those address lines because it just doesn't have room for them all on the die, and there's no reason to do that. And so it fetches stuff in, in aligned chunks. And if your instruction uh, happens to lie across a couple of those chunks, so it can't get it all in one chunk, it's got to fetch another chunk to do that, and that takes time. And so ideally, you want things to be nice and aligned. <clears throat> it's just going to make your branch faster. It's going to make your code a little faster. It's going to be really nice. Another reason why you might want alignment is because you might have to have alignment. There are x86 instructions that require their argument to be aligned. Why? Because it's going to be faster. If the x86 can assume the argument is aligned, it's just going to move quicker. And this move DQA, move double quad word, with a double quad word, that's the thing that goes in the XMM register. It's a 128 bit thing. Uh, that A means aligned. There's a U version of it too, which is unaligned, which is slow. Uh, and so if you're going to use this instruction and your, your thing you're pointing to is not aligned, you will get a processor exception, which is not bad. Linux traps it for you and it looks like a safe fault. So you'll get a safe fault if you try to use this when you're unaligned. Temporary values from the stack. So the stack should be aligned on a 16 byte boundary before you call any subroutine. That's a standard you should do. We haven't been doing that, but we could be. We've, well, that's not entirely true. We've kind of been doing that in secret. Uh, I'll tell you why. So, <clears throat> Using an aligned version of an instruction uh, will cause a processor general protection exception if the target address is not aligned and it looks like a safe fault. Here's some code. This code says load an XMM word, that's 128 bits, double quad word, into XMM zero. And so here we take rel.value one, that's right down here. There are my two quad words. And I'm gonna put those in XMM zero. And to do that, I use move APS. That is move aligned packed short. And so we'll, we'll do some stuff with XMM registers a little bit later on in the class. But for now, let's just assume I'm loading a value. Uh, then I go and get value two. And you'll notice that instead of an A here, I have a U here. This is unaligned. This does not require it to be aligned. So I go and get value two which is not aligned and it's fine, right? This value is aligned because right before it, I said align 16. This one is not aligned because right before it, I have a data byte. <laughs> and so now it's off by one. And then I have move APS, the third one, where I try to get value two using the aligned version of the instruction and something's gonna happen. Let's see what that something might be. Build X align and to see it, we can just run it and, oh, look at that, seg fault. Let's go ahead and, and run it in the debugger. And there we go, now we're running. And we're pointing to start, which is pointing to the first of those instructions. And I will mention that printing an XMM register in GDB, is quite a trip. It's, it assumes that it might, you might want four floats or you might want two uh, doubles or you might want uh, 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 16, zero, 16 uh, eight bit int, 16 uh, uh, bytes and so on. It gives you all the different ways you can have a look at it, including as a 128 bit uh, int. So right now it all contains zeros. Let's go ahead and execute that instruction. And then let's print XMM zero again. Now it's got stuff in it. Uh, the next one should work just fine too, right? That's unaligned. And then the next one is the aligned version. So let's take a step, bam, 
segfault. So hopefully I've convinced you that that's a bad thing. You can get a segfault. Alignment at start. Well, here we go. Here's some code. And in this code, I call printf. And printf can print floating point numbers. And it uses the XMM registers to print those floating point numbers and to receive them as arguments. And it expects them to be aligned. And it expects your stack to be aligned. And if your stack's not aligned, when you call printf, you'll get a seg fault. So there's no comprehensive list of which procedures need alignment and which do not. We've been using put s for a reason. It doesn't need alignment. But many other ones do. And I'm not going to tell you which ones they are because I don't know. Just most of them probably need alignment. So it's good that your code, your program, is aligned on a 16-byte boundary when it calls printf. Okay. If you were to run this code and trace into it, you trace into printf, you would eventually hit this instruction right here. Oh, look at that, XMM, and look at that, move A, move aligned, and then you would be in trouble. Okay. So over here is some code, failalign.asm. And one of the nice things about when Linux or the dynamic loader starts your program at underscore start is it arrives 16 byte aligned. And that means that right now we are aligned on a 16 byte boundary because we're coming into underscore start. It's not true for main. We'll cover that in a minute, but it is true for start. We're aligned, which means that when I push RAX, I've now added eight bytes to the stack and the stack is no longer aligned. This will work fine. This will work fine. And this will cause a seg fault. Will it really? There we go. So now we're here we are at start. Had to get to the dynamic loader for it. And if you look up at the at RSP right here, there's its address. See that zero on the end? It's aligned. It is aligned. We're good. We take a step, we push REX, and now it's not aligned. Bad. So we then go ahead and load the message. Do that, and we call printf, bam, seg fault. And you notice where it seg faults. It seg faults right here where I told you it was going to seg fault. All right. What if I don't push REX? It works. OK, so there you go. Watch out, for, watch out for that. So both Linux and dynamic load will make sure you are 16 byte aligned, because they get here not by calling you, but by jumping. They will jump to start. And call versus jump is important. So here's main. Here's a main. And the C runtime starts it with a call. And what happens when you call something is, the return address gets pushed. So if you remember looking at CRT 1.0, uh, we align the stack on a 16-byte boundary. And then we call into here, and that unaligns the stack. So when we arrive at main, the stack is off by 8. And what do we typically do? We push RBP. And pushing RBP aligns the stack. The stack is now 16 byte aligned. And there you go. When we leave, we'll pop that off the stack. And return will remove the return value. And so when we get back to the collar, the collar is back to being 16 byte aligned. OK, this is important stuff. And it is up to you to keep track of it. There's no assembly magic that will keep track of this for you. You need to keep track of this. Uh, when you write code, the calls are the code. All right. 
what if I were doing this and I wanted to push RCX and pop RCX around this call? Well, pushing it might move me off by, by eight. How do, what do I do? Well, I can push it twice. Just push it twice and then pop it twice. Problem solved. Right, as long as you push it and pops balance and you are 16 bit aligned before you call, life is good. So this code right here will work. It says fail align to dot uh, ASM. Let's go see that it does. There it is. Yeah, works just fine. Uh, <clears throat> if I added the pushes in here, it would fail. So alignment with and. Another thing you can do is this, and you will see this in code. So notice what I'm doing. I'm coming into main, and I'm anding RSP with minus 16. In the twos complement world, minus 16 is a bunch of Fs with a zero in the last position. And so this zeroes out the low four bits of RSP. Is that OK? Sure it is, right? I reserve space on the stack by subtracting from RSP. And so this converts RSP into a, into a lower value, moves it up. And so it may waste a few bytes on the stack, but that's OK. At the end of this, I am aligned. So it subtracts whatever has to be subtracted from RSP to get it to be aligned. If that's, a, if that's one byte, two bytes, three bytes, zero bytes, whatever it is, it subtracts that from RSP to align it. That's the effect of this AND. Now, I've modified the stack pointer. And I'm going to return. If I were going to call exit, I wouldn't care. But because I'm going to return, I do care. I have to restore the stack at the end. I've just messed it up here. How do I undo this? Well, I undo this by saving it before I do it, and then by restoring it at the end. And I'm using R12 here uh, just because. You could use RBP. That's what you traditionally use. I just want to show you don't have to use that. You could use something else. So here I used R12. And this will work fine. This code will run just fine. All right. <clears throat> if you want to read a lot more about why things get aligned and how to make your code run faster and, and why crazy things are in the code you look at that comes out of C, there is a wonderful reference. Uh, Agner Fogg wrote this wonderful set of references on optimization. He's done a number of other stuff as well, but the optimization stuff is truly great. Optimizing assembly is the de facto standard for how you optimize assembly. There's one in there about optimizing for compilation. There's others as well. This is it. This is the thing that if you dig around online, eventually someone is going to point you to this. All right. Let's take a break. Program flow review. <clears throat> so a flow graph is just a graph whose vertices are our program nodes, they could be single instructions, they could be lines of code, they could be subprograms, whatever makes sense. And typically we think of them in two varieties, a function node and a predicate node. Uh, there can be other kinds as well, but this is gonna suit us pretty well for what we need to do. A proper program is a program with a single entry point. Control enters the program in a single place. And a single exit. When control leaves the proper program, it goes to a single destination. Uh, and then for every node of the program, there's a path from entry to exit that contains the node. So there's no unreachable code or trap code because we wouldn't know how to analyze that. Proper programs basically represent functions. They look, they have flow graphs that look like this one down here. Composition, that's just where I take a node. In a, in a program flow and I expand it by replacing it with something like a loop or a sequence or an if then else or any other old proper program. And I can do that because basically I, for example, like this little do block here, it's got an in and an out. I just pull it out and I drop some other thing that has a single entry, single exit in it and I'm good. And the result's still gonna be a proper program if the thing I plug in is a proper program. So there you go. And we can call this a composite program if you want to be fancy. Prime programs, those are proper programs with no proper subprogram of more than a single node. So 
Uh, here, I have a little sequence. I can't make it any small without it being a single node. Here and if then else, same thing applies. Here is a while loop, same thing applies. This one's not, right? I can cut this and I can cut this. And now I have this little proper subprogram, which is a sequence. And, <clears throat> and so this is not a prime. Structured program is a program composed using a fixed basis set of primes. That is, it contains only some allowable set of control structures. That's it. Whew. Back to reviewing the structure theorem, which we talked about last time. Every proper program is execution equivalent, meaning it's going to execute the same nodes in the same order, to a structured program composed from while do, if then else, and sequence using only the original function and predicate nodes and possibly an additional uh, counter that's limited by a number of bits. And Harlan Mills is your source for the proof on that. And here's how the proof works. The proof is constructive. Uh, step one, assign every operation in the program an integer and assign the exit of the program the number zero. Uh, divide the operations into classes. Uh, you may have to do some stuff for assembly, but that's okay. If there's a function, it's going to perform something and then it's going to go on to this next index. So we've numbered this node. Let's say we give it seven. We've numbered the node it hits here. Let's say it's nine. It's going to do seven. And then we're going to set the counter equal to nine. Same thing down here. We do something and we are going to go on to maybe let's say five or 17. And so we'd set the counter equal to five, the counter equal to 17 up here. And we would create a little sequence or an if then else. And so I've gone from a little node, a function predicate node, to a little program prime, a sequence or an if then else. And I can in turn treat that as if it's a little set program. There we go. So that's step two. I mean, step one was number them. Step two is do this for each one of them. Step three is plug them in, plug them into the structure. <clears throat> we initialize C to be the first node on entry. While it's not the exit, not zero, then if it's one, we do this. If it's two, we do this, and so on. And there you go. There's more details to the proof itself, but, but trust me, it's, it's, uh, it's a sort of proof by picture. The, uh, the full proof can be found in the literature. But more importantly, this tells us how to structure a program. Let's look at an example of doing this. And so we need a problem to look at, and I've been picking on this one for a while, so I'll keep picking on this one. There's something called Exxon Exxon flow control, which you may or may not be aware of. It's a serial uh, flow control system. What is flow control? Flow control decides who gets to talk and when they can talk. And so if I'm sending data to a receiver and the receiver's buffer fills up, the receiver needs to tell me, stop sending. And it can do that with special lines, uh, like DTS and CTS, and, and there are even a few other standards for it. Uh, or it can do that by transmitting back a byte to me to tell me, stop, and wait till I catch up. And that byte could, would be X off, say transmit off, which is a control S, or 13, if you count it, proceeded S is the 13th, because that's how the control stuff typically works. So 13 is the X off, Q is X on, and there you go. And these are hex, of course. <clears throat> and your terminal probably supports this. So if I can get my terminal back, there we go. Uh, find dot, that didn't run long enough. Let's go to find dot. And if I can, uh, I didn't get out in time. Hit control S. I didn't even hit it. My terminal just hangs up. If I hit Control Q, then all that stuff comes through. And so if you ever had a terminal hang on you, it could be because you hit Control S. Just hit Control Q. All right. So X on X off is still a thing that's around, and it shows up in all kinds of places. We want to implement this. This is code that I. Uh, liberated from a piece of software that talks to an old Apple laser writer. 
got a head lying around. <clears throat> and uh, you see at the top, it defines X on and X off. It's got a, it's got a little header that does that defines some stuff to transmit uh, serial code and bytes. I thought about rebuilding this for an Arduino, but I don't know. I don't want to add too much complexity to the program. So here you go. Same with X off. <clears throat> I give it the length I want to send, and then I give it the bytes I want to send. I have an index that I set to zero, index into the buffer. I have a char that I define up top because uh, it's usually better to define your stuff up here for embedded stuff and for performance. And some old compilers like the one I was using here actually require this stuff to be defined up front. You can't define it later on. So here's top, it's a label. If the index is len, I'm done, right? If my index is zero and my length is zero, it's transmitting. So I return index, which is my way of saying I have sent zero bytes. There you go. Otherwise, I want to send a byte. And I send the byte that's in the buffer at position index. I increment index. I then go and see if there's anything I need to read. So read byte uh, is a little method that goes and checks to see if there's a byte pending to read. And if so, it reads it and gives it to me. And I'll then check to see if that character is X off. And if it's not an X off, because the laser writer transmits stuff back to you all the time. If it's not X off, uh, then I go back up to top. And I check to see if index is len and so on, increment it. And I keep doing this until they're equal and I return the result. And I've transmitted all the bytes. If it is X off, well, then I fall, don't do this. I fall through here and I hit this wait. Uh, label. I then read the byte and I check to see if that byte is or is not X on. If it's not, <coughs> excuse me, X on, I go to wait. I read the next byte and I check it and I keep spinning here until I get X on. Otherwise, I go to top, back up here, resume the loop where I'm sending stuff. And there you go. I'm spinning in this loop, I'm spinning in this loop. And I'm moving between them. And that's sending my stuff. And this is this is legit C code. This is perfectly valid C code. Uh, this code in the Linux kernel looks shockingly similar to this. I mean, shockingly similar to this. Uh, it's just much longer, and I didn't feel like getting something long. So I thought this would be a nice short example. So a couple of questions here. One, is this a proper program? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Single entry, single exit, no unreachable or trap code. Everybody's either too muted or too scared to answer. The answer is yes, it's a proper program. Right, we come in here at the top, and we run the stuff in here. We return to the caller. It's the only exit. We could have multiple returns in here that all return to the caller. That'd be fine. They all go back to the same place. <clears throat> and of course, the code's all reachable. And so there we go. Proper program. Is a structured program in the sense that we built it out of sequence, if then else, while do, no, it's not. It's not a structured program. It kind of looks like a while loop, but it's got this weird return in, in, up here at the top. That's not what we need it to be. So it's not quite. So let's build a flow graph for it and see what that looks like. Here is the flow graph for it. Super complicated stuff here, people. Uh, index is zero, CH is zero. Here's my little top guy, right? There's top, and there's top. If I check to see if index is length, if it is, I'm done, return the index. If it's not, I plow ahead, send a byte, increment the index, read a byte, check to see if it's X off. If it's not X off, I go around. If it is, I come in here to wait, read a byte, see if it's X on. And while it's not X on, I spin. When it's finally X on, I come up here and back to the top. There you go. So there's my little uh, flow graph for it. You should be able to take a program that looks like this, or some assembly even maybe, and produce something that looks like this. Let's structure it. So let's apply the structure theorem to it. Oh, but, but, oh, this is a proper program. Single entry, single exit, path through everything. Life's pretty good. Is it structured? We'll come back to that. That's an that's a interesting question. So we're going to structure it with sequence while do. 
we're going to use a do while just because it's going to be convenient to do so and an if then else. <clears throat> so step one is to number the nodes. That's a super complicated and very hard step. I made it harder because I wanted to show that the numbering is arbitrary. And so I started out one, two, three, but I didn't want you to think you had to do it that way. So I did one, two, three, four, five over here, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. So I threw this in here just to, to, just to, just to be obnoxious. Uh, the numbering is arbitrary. You need to keep track of what the first thing is, and you need to number the exit line zero. Other than that, you number them however you want to number them. And last one. So then I create all the little primes. Where did these things come from? So here's, in, let's, look at, let's pick on five. Index is equal to len, true is 10, false is three. Here's five, and it's equal to len. On true, I go to 10. On false, I go to three. And so that's where that came from. This just tells me, C tells me the node I'm about to execute. Think of it like your program counter. And, uh, and so I modify the program counter and then that's what it does. So once I've built all these little programs, this is super simple. And I've used C as my label here. I need to put it in a larger structure. And so here we go. I initialize C to one because one is the first is the, the number of the first node I reach on entry. If that had been 14, I would have initialized it to 14. And then I come into a while loop. This is a while loop here. It may not look obviously like one, but it is. So I check to see if C is not equal to zero. And while that's true, I do all this stuff. When it's false, I exit. So uh, a little sequence of a setting and then a while loop. And so the first thing I do is see, is C equal to one? This is an if then else. Here's the then part. The else part is everything below it. Same for this. Then part, everything below it is else. So a bunch of nested ifs. <clears throat> I check to see if it's one. If it is, I do this. This is this. Really not complicated. So I set C to one, come in here. It's not equal to zero. It is equal to one. So I set index equal to zero and set C two. Come around. It's not zero, it is two. So I do CH equals zero, set C equal to five, come around, come down here. I check to see if index is len. Uh, if it's not, I set C equal to three, come around and so on. So you see, I'm simulating the original control flow of the program using this process. And the whole thing is here. Here's the second half of it. If you fear that I'm, I'm being lazy. My daughter is running around like crazy outside, so I'll close the door. Um, <clears throat> she's home with, with COVID. So uh, there we go. I can take some of those primes and combine them. What do I mean by that? So let's go back to these little guys right here. So after I set this equal to zero, I set C equal to two, and we know that I'm going to go around the loop, and I'm going to do this next. I'm going to set CH equal to zero. Does anybody else reference two? And nobody else does. So after I do this, I'll always do this, and nobody else will do it. So I might as well take this and plug it in here. And so I have index equals zero, followed by CH equals zero, followed by C getting set to five. So the idea is if something is referenced exactly once, like two, I can plug in for that reference. Now, clearly I can't plug in for the first one because this has to always be the start. And if things are referenced twice, like, like C equal five here and here and here and here, I don't want to plug in for that. I want to, uh, uh, because I have to duplicate stuff. But if I just do it for the ones that are only referenced once, I wind up with these three structures. Here's one. This is structure five. This is structure one. And this is structure eight. And these are all referenced multiple times, right? Five is referenced here and here and here. Eight is referenced here and here. And one is the entry. So I can't reduce it. So there you go. This is what I end up with when I put these three structures. That can be really helpful. 
if I build my, if I initialize and build my program loop now, it looks like this, which sort of looks more like a, a nicely structured program. There's some stuff to think about here. I set C equal to one, I come in, I do this, and then I never do this again. I always do it the first time, I never do it again. So really I could factor this code out. This, these blocks, index zero and ch equals zero, they could move up here. So I'd have c gets one, index zero, ch zero, c equal five, and then come into here. In that case, this is redundant. And so I throw it away. And I just start out with this, this, and then setting it to this, and now we have these, these two blocks inside it for c equal two and, and c equal eight. And I would just oscillate between them. So it turns out when you do this kind of analysis, it exposes a latent structure that's in the program. <clears throat> and in particular, what's happening down here at eight is I'm reading a byte, checking if it's exon, and then spinning until it is. So this is my little, and of course I go around to do it, but this is my little wait for exon state. And this is my transmit and check for X off state. So these are really major program states and they tend to pop out when you do structuring this way. And that can be really useful for an obfuscated piece of, uh, of code. So there you go. So if I uh, wanted you to structure something, you would need to do the complicated work of numbering the nodes, of building all the little sub programs. Maybe I would want you to be done at that point or maybe I'd want you to uh, combine the ones you could combine. I would probably not ask you to build this, <laughs> but, it, but getting to this state is, is pretty good. And can we go further? We absolutely can. So the, part of the point of this is, this is a very mechanical procedure. I can write code and I have written code that does this and others have too. Uh, when, you, when you see a piece of assembly being read in and structured C code popping out the other side, they're doing this, okay? All right, I can identify loops, right? Here's structure number eight. So when C is eight, I come in here and on this path, I leave C at eight. So I go around and do this again. This is like a little loop. And because it has this specific structure, it's easy for me to just turn it right into a do, a do while, Let's turn it into a do while. So I do read the byte while ch not equal to exon and I set c equal. So c is eight and then I set it to eight again. This is a redundant node. It's already eight. I might as well get rid of it. And so there we go. Simpler. Now, something to notice is I just threw away a reference to eight. The program had to. I figured that was redundant. I threw it away. Now the program just has one reference to eight. That means I can substitute for eight. And I do, I just plug it in right here. So this was originally, uh, this chunk right here was originally C equal eight, but now I've plugged in my new uh, sub program eight and I've eliminated it from the, uh, the larger program. There we go. And <clears throat> so now I would only have one entry. If I move the program, sub program one out of the loop, and I've combined the two that were left in the loop, I just have one thing in the loop and that's, that's really convenient. And really, if I take a look at this, I have C equal five here and C equal five here. This is an if then else. So when on the then side, I set C equal to five. On the else side, I set C equal to five. Those are the same thing at the end. I can factor that out. There it is, C equal five. So I went from having you know, a bunch of references to it to just having this one right here. I can't substitute the whole thing for this. I could if I wrote it recursively, but that would be madness. So, but I can notice that this once again has a structure that exposes a local loop, right? I check this predicate and if it is false, I do this and repeat. So I do this section right here while this predicate is false. So if I invert this predicate, if I check to see if index is not equal to length, 
then I do this stuff while that is true. And then after it, I do this. And that looks like this. So you notice I've inverted the predicate. I come in, I check the loop, I check the loop predicate. If it's true, I do all the stuff I told you about and go around again. Uh, if it's false, I come out and do the other, other branch. And when I did that, I eliminated this redundant C equal five node. So that's gone. And so here we go. This tells me to stop the top loop, but really it's redundant now too, because this will run and then the program always ends. So I'm kind of done. If I get rid of that, right? I end up with just these two, right? This one, I might move out at the start. This is my thing to run to end. I can substitute this into here for this one reference. And here's my whole program. And I don't need that loop. And I don't even need the counter, right? I've eliminated the counter entirely. Got lucky this time. And I eliminated that funny loop structure with all the nested ifs. That's gone. This is my whole program. And there we go. And it looks, looks fairly nice. Uh, and my claim for you is that this is a structured program. Is it, is it really? Uh, so it's built from while do and the do while, just for convenience. Right, I could make this into a while do by, for example, duplicating this node, moving over here, and then moving the predicate over. So I do this once, and then I do a while do of it. I can do that. But no need to do that. And it is. So let's go take a look at it. So here we have a sequence. And here we have a sequence. These are two little sequences, right? This is a sequence of two. This is a sequence of two. And then that followed by another one is another sequence and the whole thing could just be thought of as a sequence. Here's a do while over here. There's that structure, single in, single out, proper program, happens to be a prime, in this case, do while. Here's an if then else, right? Come in, here's the then part, happens to be empty. The else part happens to have something on it. It's okay, I can invert the predicate or I can just have an empty then part. Nothing too complicated. That's a sequence, right? I do this sequence followed by this if then else, which has a do while as its else part. This whole thing is a while do, this, this larger blue box. But right? I come in here, while this is true, I do this body. And then when it's no longer true, I exit. And the whole program is a long sequence. So it's a structured program. And hopefully you see why, right? It's, it's built by combining these structures in this disciplined way. And I wind up with a structured program at the end. I can just read off the program. So if I go back up here, I see this is a do while. So I would say do ch is read by while ch is not exon. There we go do ch is read by while ch is not equal to exon. There it is. I embed that in, you know, ch not equal to x off and the else part. And so I've inverted ch equal to x off. And so this is now the then part. Didn't have to do that, but it's cleaner code. And then here's the body of the while loop. Here's the whole thing. And I'm good. This is my newly nicely structured program. And it's not, it's a little slightly longer. Uh, it doesn't have anything new in it. The reason it's longer is because I have more brackets <laughs> in it on lines by themselves. So I wind up with slightly longer than this was. Uh, this cheated by having all of its if on one line. But this is the way the code was written, so I just preserved it. Uh, and there you go. So I've gone from this thing to a structured program, and I can do this in an automated fashion. And if I have assembly spaghetti code, I can do this and wind up with structured assembly, assembly that has if then else's and while loops and those kinds of things. And that can ease my analysis or at least hopefully ease it. I'm running out of time. I'm nearly done, I promise. The, the, the trick to this that I sort of alluded to earlier is that the original flow graph was actually already structured, it was secretly structured. Uh, the code itself wasn't, but if you take a look at this, look at that, that's a do until. And since we said we were going to admit do until, 
There it is. And then what's this? Well, here's a predicate. False, we do this. True, we go this way. They merge back up here. That's an if then else, right? Single in, single out, uh, if then else. And then the whole thing here is secretly a, uh, a, uh, a while loop where the predicate has been negated. So while the predicate's false, we do this loop. And as soon as it's true, we terminate. The whole thing's a sequence. So there you go. It's secretly already there. Yeah, you could have spotted that early on and just said, you know what? Here's your structured program, right? You might want to invert a predicate here and invert a predicate here, but, but there you go. I don't have time to talk about basic blocks because we are out of time. Uh, so uh, I'm going to stop here and this is where we'll pick up next time.